Yeah, everyone. Um, as Teriki said, my name is Jaden, and today I'm going to be talking about the results from my first PhD paper, which has been accepted for publication. So I know you've heard uh, quite a bit about EOI already. Well, uh, newsflash, I'm going to revise it again just for context of the talk. So uh, the epoch of reionization is an important period in cosmic history that occurs between a redshift of 5.4 to 10, roughly, where the first stars, galaxies, and compact objects um, reionize the predominantly neutral uh, hydrogen medium. We care about this time in cosmic history because it links the uh, structures that we know um, in, in the cosmic microwave background of the universe um, to the local structures that we see in the present day universe today. However, um, and the way we probe this is by uh, measuring or trying to measure the uh, hyperfine transition of the 21 centimeter neutral hydrogen, the red shifted signal of that. However, the current generation of radio interferometers are not quite sensitive enough to directly uh, image the submission from this epoch. So instead we're focused on measuring the statistics. Heard a little bit about uh, power spectra from Nicole. I'm just gonna revise a little bit here. Um, so if effectively the power spectrum is just tells you how much signal you have on different spatial scales. Here we can see an example of the expected 21 centimeter power spectrum uh, taken from a simulation where on the y-axis we just have power in units of milli Kelvin squared megaparsecs cubed. And on the x-axis we have spatial scale in terms of per megaparsec. So small values mean large spatial scales. And we uh, probe the statistics with low frequency radio interferometers like the MWA, which you would have heard from uh, Kath. And that's because this has an observation uh, frequency bandwidth that covers that uh, redshift range that we're interested in. However, um, interferometers don't just see the EOR signal, they also see intervening foreground sources like extragalactic point, uh, extragalactic radio sources in the galactic plane. And these can be up to five orders of magnitude brighter than the expected 21 centimeter signal. These need to be removed from our data if you want to retrieve that signal. Um, so one of the ways we try to mitigate that is we try to observe away from really bright things. So here we have an example uh, observation of the EOR2 field. So the black contour is the primary beam response to the antenna. This is what Nicole was talking about. The black contours are the lowest sensitivity at about uh, one in a thousand. And then the green contours are where most of your sensitivity is located, and that's your main field of view. Um, these blue dots are extra galactic radio sources. These are bright radio sources. And that black smudge that you see is the galactic plane. So you can see that this field is pointed away from those sources, a relatively benign part of the field, and it's placed everything like the galactic plane um, in low sensitivity regions. So these are typically ignored. However, there are incredibly bright uh, radio galaxies and gal uh, other radio sources. So for example, Centaurus A is one of the brightest radio galaxies in the sky. It's on the order of 4,000-ish Janskis um, at uh, the frequencies that we're interested in measuring here. Um, and it's located in the side load for this particular observation. And we also have like plane supernova remnants, which have angular sizes, which are comparable to the uh, reionization bubbles. And they can have uh, flux densities also varying from one to a thousand Janskis. Not only that, they happen to be in parts of the primary beam that have high chromaticity and in part highly varying uh, spectral structure to these sources. And that causes issues uh, in your ability to detect the 21 centimeter signal as well. So this paper was focused on trying to determine what level of contamination these wide field extended sources might have on our ability to detect the 21 centimeter power spectrum. So particularly it was focused on creating morphological models of Centaurus A and galactic plane supernova remnants. So we could then use these uh, to perform uh, simulations of MWA observations and then generate those visibilities, which we could then use to create 
uh, calculate power spectra and then compare to the expected 21 centimeter power spectra. So here's an example of one of these supernova remnants. Here we, uh, this supernova remnant in particular is called Puppus A. It's one of the brightest supernova remnants in the galactic plane, it's roughly a degree in size. This is a Gleam image. Gleam was an all sky survey conducted with the MWA. I'm not going to go into too much detail about the morphological modeling process because I unfortunately don't have enough time. But if you'd like to know more, I'm happy to answer questions or you can read my, my paper. It's up on archive. But essentially, what I did was I took the brightest and the biggest supernova remnants, roughly a sample of about 70, and I um, took these Gleam images and then I performed some image processing techniques using the Python package science kit images, basically just some form of peak detection. And then I fit uh, 2D Gaussians to these peaks to retrieve this model that you see on the right. This is a 41 Gaussian component model of this particular supernova remnant. And this is relatively accurate to about that one to 10% error for all of the supernova remnants that I fit. And this is good enough for the purposes of this paper that we're, um, for the question of this paper that I'm investigating. I performed a similar process with the exceptionally bright radio galaxy center SA. On the left here, you can see the immaculate image that uh, was on the cover of Nature Astronomy back in November. Um, but one of the issues with Centaur SA is it's, it's bloody large. It's, it's like five degrees by eight degrees, and it also covers a huge dynamic range of um, angular scales. So in order to properly uh, model this source, I had to break it into component regions. You can see some examples of its component regions here, and then perform similar image processing techniques, slightly different. Um, again, if you want to know more details, happy to answer that, um, to create this 61 Gaussian component model we see on the right. And this is uh, roughly accurate, um, at 90% accurate in terms of total flux density. Uh, it's missing some of the intermediate angular scales, but Again, this is good enough to uh, answer the questions in this particular paper. So now that we have these morphological models, the next step is to actually perform simulations of this particular field of uh, EOR2. And so for this paper, we simulated uh, two observations. The, the first observation we simulated was the same one that I showed at the very beginning of this talk, where Centaur SA is located in that side lobe. And the second, this is called the side lobe observation. And then the second observation, uh, Centaurus A is located in null. That's a minimum part in the sensitivity of the uh, primary beam. Um, and we call this a null uh, observation. Then we created a series of partial sky models. This is differing proportions of the total supernova remnant flux density. And we created uh, a deep model, which only contained 10%, uh, medium, which contained 50%, a shallow, which contained 90%, and a total that contained 100% and calculated the power spectra for all of these sky models and compared it to the 21 centimeter signal. And that's what you can see here. So we have two figures. The one on the left is the side lobe observation. The one on the right is the null observation. The purple dash dot curve is the expected 21 centimeter signal um, with noise included. And the black squares with the dashed line is the Centaur say only sky model power spectra. Uh, for both, both, um, both of these plots, you can see there's a huge difference between it being located in the side lobe and it being located in null. This indicates that might be a useful strategy for reducing its contamination when observing this type of field. And then we have the blue circles with the solid blue line, which is the total supernova remnant uh, power spectra. It looks uh, frighteningly similar to the expected signal in the side lobe case. And then we have the shallow, the uh, medium, and the deep with the orange crosses, the green triangles, and the red diamonds. And so what you see here is that really to get a good differentiation between uh, the supernova remnant's contamination level and the expected signal, you really have to subtract more than 50% of the total contribution in either case of the uh, supernova remnants in order to get a good uh, relative difference between the two. So, that really concludes everything, but in conclusion, um, just wrapping up, Centaurus A needs to be mitigated or either subtracted entirely from the data to reduce its contamination. And uh, as I previously said, it needs to subtract at least 50% or more of those supernova remnants um, in order to reduce your overall contamination. 
Thank you.